Hello everyone and welcome to the final night of the Football Writing Festival this evening at the National Football Museum. Now tonight we have some amazing panellists including reporter and broadcaster Miriam Walker Khan and also we've got Dr Carrie Dunn here who's an acclaimed author and academic. So the National Football Museum Hall of Fame aims to celebrate and highlight achievements of those who've made outstanding contributions to football. And back in 2019, we had a relaunch in order to represent 50% of females in the sport. Now, I hope some of you also got the chance to see our Crossing the Line Game On exhibition, which shows the journey of women's football from grassroots right up to the professional game. Now, with that in mind, I'd like to reflect on the career of a super, super special guest we have with us this evening. Now, she began playing for Crew when she was 23 before moving to Italy in 1985, where she played for several clubs, including Napoli and Trani. And she moved back to England, where she played for Crew, Knowsley, Liverpool and Croydon. And during her 16-year international career, she got a huge 18 caps for England and scored 44 goals. Our guest starred in the 1984 UEFA Championship final and England's first ever FIFA Women's World Cup in 1995. Our judges voted unanimously to induct our guest into the Hall of Fame here in recognition of her groundbreaking football career and her pioneering successes as the first ever black female professional footballer for England. She laid the foundations for the ethnically diverse sporting community that we have today. So could we have a huge round of applause for the absolutely amazing Kerry Davis. Congratulations to the newest inductee to the English Football Hall of Fame. Kerry, how Thank does you. it feel? I'm going to sit down. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> we all got excited and just wanted to congratulate you. <laughs> how does it feel? Very honoured. Yeah. You very, absolutely very deserve it. Yeah, very happy. Thank you very much. So, shall we kick things off and talk about you starting your football career and how it was and some of your inspirations back then? Uh, so I started playing football because I used to go everywhere with my brother Wayne. He's there in the front, so he's to blame. So, yeah, I started playing as a toddler. Um, and I remember my dad watching the 1970 World Cup. Uh, I watched the Brazilians play then, and they were just a fabulous team. So my inspirations then, and my role models were male footballers because I didn't know any female footballers, um, so biggest inspiration to me was probably Pele. So Carrie, can you give us some kind of background on the early history of the international women's game? <laughs> yeah, I guess going back to the very, very start of football, all those football's roots, um, men's and females um, football was developing pretty much in parallel, but then obviously, as we all know, probably by now, uh, the impact of the 1921 FA ban. So, uh, we, we say ban, draw at hand, um, it wasn't that the FA said you can't play anymore and then women stopped playing, it was you can't play on FA affiliated pitches. So, it meant that you couldn't play on anything decent, but women did carry on playing on kind of parks and scrubland and rugby pitches and whatever they could find, but it didn't mean that people didn't know about women's football. It was kind of suppressed. It was happening in secret. And so it meant that until that ban was lifted, and we'll, I'm sure we'll talk about this in a little bit more detail in, in the 1970s, it wasn't until then in the formation of the official England women's team that we start to get more complete records being kept. Okay, so exciting. Now, Kerry, Rome is a little bit different from Crewe. So what was it like <laughs> moving to Italy and playing over there? Um, to be honest, it was very difficult because I didn't speak uh, the language. Um, I think the only word that I knew when I went out there was ciao. And if you don't know, <laughs> that means hello and goodbye. Um, so it was a big culture shock. 
uh, to be honest, but um, it's probably the best thing I did to actually make myself develop as a football footballer. The food was wonderful. Uh, the people were great. My teammates were great. So um, it was a great decision to go there. What were some of your best moments when you were out there? Um, so I actually didn't win any trophies. Um, so I, I, the first team I played for was Lazio. When I played for Lazio, Trani won the championship. <laughs> then the following season, I transferred to Trani and Lazio won the championship. <laughs> 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 so it's quite difficult. And I can remember um, when I was playing for Trani, we only had to draw against Lazio and our centre-half decided to dribble the ball out, lost the ball. Uh, a player called Carolina Maracci scored, so we finished runners-up. Um, but the whole thing of actually playing football full-time, uh, those are my best memories, being able to train every day instead of in the evening, twice a week, sometimes just once a week. So just the whole experience was um, brilliant for my development as a person and as a player. And I enjoyed the experience very much. What made you move back? Um, so... You can't play football forever in the women's game, and especially in the day when I played. So I had to come back, get a proper job, and lead a normal life because I didn't earn millions like the players do now. Um, so, yeah, that was my reason to come back. Well, we're glad you came back, and we're glad you won your <laughs> award today. Now, this one's for everyone. Were there any standout international tournament that you think were milestones in the women's game? I mean, you have to start with 1984 and the, uh, the, the first official women's Euros. Um, actually, this summer, I was writing about the 1984 Euros. We finally dug out some photos of the final, the England-Sweden final, which I don't think the 1984 squad had seen before. I mean, uh, I was talking to some of the players, and I'm, I texted Kerry over the summer, I said, have you seen any of these pictures before? I'm like, we hadn't seen any of the final. Mm. There's a fantastic one we found of Kerry, just like, I, up to your waist in mud, wasn't it? <laughs> Kennewood, yeah, Kennewood yeah. Road. But um, 1984 um, tournament, I think, is, is, is fairly, is, is, is a qu quite a big milestone. What do you remember of that final, Kerry, apart from the pitch being abysmal? Um, so we played out in Sweden because it was done over two legs. two, two legs. So we played out in Sweden. And I just remember that um, just Sweden just battered us that day. And they peppered our goal. And our goalkeeper, Terry Wiseman, she just had a brilliant game. And it kept, we kept it to 1-0. So it gave us a chance for the second leg. Then the second leg, leg it was played at Luton Town. And it just poured down with rain the whole weekend. So when Carrie was saying that I was knee-deep in mud, that's how bad the pitch was. It, <laughs> if it had been a men's game, it probably would have been called off for sure. <laughs> and anyway, we got back to 1-1. And it went straight. We didn't have extra time, am I right? Went straight right. to penalties. Then uh, we lost on penalties. And the only consolation I have, because I've got my pride, is I did score my penalty. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but it was quite painful, actually, losing in that final. It's something that even now, years later, I think about what could we have done better. One of the interesting things about that final as well is um, the Sweden leg, there, I, I found the full match, the footage of it. I haven't found f full match of the leg back at Luton. I found extended highlights, but not the actual full match. And I think Kerry's right when she says that if it was a men's game, it would have been called off. But of course, also, because you were amateurs, yeah. um, there wasn't that flexibility in the schedule. So you guys flew back from Sweden, didn't you? And you're like... Back, back to work the next yeah, day, pretty much, yeah. and then ready to go to Luton for the next leg. It, it, it wasn't like having training camps now, was it? It was mm. just like back to work and then back yeah, to football. Yeah. You can't imagine that in today's game, no, can you? I mean, of course, they had two weeks between, between, the, between the legs, didn't you? Yeah. So it was like going home from camp and, and, yeah. and then getting back to it. So that kind of squad togetherness must have been really important to you at the time as well. I, I, that, the squad that I played in, um, great spirit and really enjoyed my time. We had some really great characters and we had fun and we laughed. And I think when the FA f took over, actually that fun went away a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> what about when you played in the World Cup? How was that? Um, 
I was hoping to go somewhere more exotic, actually. <laughs> so we went to Sweden uh, for the World Cup that I played in. But no, it was really enjoyable, great experience. And um, me as a player, I always wanted to play against the best. And those are the opportunities you get when you play in World Cups. Now, what about the development of the WSL in 2011? So we can bring Miriam into the conversation. Now, obviously, Hope Powell was a hugely significant person in that. How do you think this period impacted women's football? What, 2011 onwards? Yes. I think it's just grown so much in the past kind of 10 years, and it's kind of become mainstream. And even in the past two or three years, obviously, it's just accelerated at such a ridiculous level, which is amazing. Just the fact that it became mainstream and, you know, with, with the TV now, obviously, we can all watch it, but fandoms were really built and you go to places, thank you, oh, <laughs> you go to places like, I support Chelsea Women, so you go to King's Meadow and the fans are just incredible and they've made that stadium their own. Um, so, yeah, I think it, the WSL is amazing. I think just to see how far it's come has been brilliant. I know you mentioned earlier when we were backstage about you're still trying to get recognition for those who didn't have the same kind of opportunities that these women have now. Yeah. Um, so if, if I get asked to do anything like this, my main aim is um, I played in a generation where they had some great, wonderful players. And up until just recently, they've never been acknowledged, honoured or recognised. So... What I try to do is, if uh, I get asked to do anything like that, is to come, engage and speak so that those players are remembered. Because um, without sounding big-headed, um, the players of today, they stand standing on giant shoulders. And I think up until recently, those players have been forgotten. And they paid to play football, had to go to work, uh, train like after they'd finished work, I made lots of sacrifices, you know, to play the game that they loved. Are you happy with the progress that women's football's made, or do you still think it's got a long way to go? I'm happy with the progress um, it's made. I'm not so happy how long it's taken it to get where it is today. Um, it's going the right way without a shadow of a doubt. Um, the England team whether it be under 23s, the senior team, the teams under, they're set up. They now need to take girls' football into schools and allow girls to play football in schools so it, then it can go to the next step. Because when I look at the, the German team, even though they're in transition at the moment, um, when I played against Germany, um, all the players that played, they've become coaches and as generations of players in England that have not had opportunities to develop a co as coaches or be in women's football, now it's much better. So I want that to push on and be even better. And I think we all do here. We're ready for women's football to just keep on rising. So back to the development of the WSL, how did that impact the game? I think that the interesting thing with WSL is it took so long for it actually to launch. There's been a lot of talk around launching a semi-professional league, which is what WSL effectively was up until you know, a couple of years ago. I know it's kind of thought as professional, but it wasn't fully professional until like 18 months ago. So, yes, they've been talking about it. They looked at America and the way that the American leagues had been running and had collapsed, and they were trying to learn lessons from the way that had operated so, which is why you start to see at the start of WSL a very different kind of football league. You've got this licensing system. So, when the WSL first launched, it's geographically spread all across the country as well. So, the idea is that there would be kind of a bigger catchment area for each team to draw fans and also talent. And 
Because they also had like squad caps, salary caps, all those kind of restrictions to make sure that England players were evenly spread to ensure a competitive league. Because before that we'd seen you know, Arsenal dominating, you see Doncaster Bells dominating. So that was another thing to try and ensure competition. And we've seen the WSL gradually shift towards the kind of football leagues that we're used to watching in England. So with promotion and relegation without necessarily such strict squad caps and salary caps. But we are also seeing this growth of interest, which I think is really interesting. This one club philosophy, which you'll know very well from Manchester City, trying to draw fans over from the, from the men's game as well, rather than just marketing it to families and little girls, which is what it initially was at first. So we're seeing kind of different markets being appealed to for the top flight of women's football now, which I think is really interesting. And as uh, Miriam said, it, it is going more mainstream. We're drawing in kind of casual viewers. People watch the Euros over the summer and they talked about it at the office, just, you know, did you see the match last night? It's not, did you see the women's football last night? It's just the match now, which I think is a really significant change that we've seen in recent years. Absolutely. And how do you think former tournaments have informed the modern football landscape and the kind of atmosphere in the modern day, like with the new fans? That's a really interesting question. I could probably talk for hours about it, but I'm not going well, to. Here. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's go. <laughs> um, no, I think what's interesting is women's football traditionally has not been quite as tribal as the men's game. Mm. We've kind of not had segregation of kind of home and away fans. We're starting to see maybe sometimes we, we might have that now because um, there's so many people being drawn to it. So I think it was a bit of a sad loss, really. I like that kind of mixing and swapping ends at halftime that you used to get in the men's and non-league games. So we are seeing a change, I think, in women's football because of the sheer numbers of people who are now interested in it. So I think that's a big positive. I am a little bit nostalgic for the past, but that's because I'm quite old-fashioned. And how was it for you when you played for England? What was the fans like then? What was the atmosphere like when you played? Mm -hmm. So when I first started playing, not many people turned up to the game. A different type of marketing. Um, the media were not interested in the game, so the crowds were really, really small. But I think that um, I actually, the crowds at the women's game, I actually prefer because I watch wom the women's game, I watch the men's game, and I like the vibe at the women's game. And even when I played, I liked the vibe. It was good, but we, we didn't get the mass crowds, but it was still enjoyable. How did it feel make you, making your debut for England? How did it feel on that day? Um, I got quite lucky, actually, because I used to play for Crew Ladies, and I made my debut against Northern Ireland at Crew Alexander. So it was just perfect for me that all my family and friends uh, could come and watch. And as I said before, that uh, as a I'm the sort of player, I was very competitive and wanted to play against the best players to see how good I could be. So playing for England, it's, it's the pinnacle of where a player wants to be. And it's lovely that so many of your family and friends are still here supporting you mm -hmm. tonight when you're winning a massive award in your career. Yeah. So how does it feel watching this generation and seeing England win the Euros for the first time this summer? How does it feel? Uh, I mean, I think when I was sat at Wembley on that day, I mean, I cried a lot during that final. Like I cried too. <laughs> <laughs> for different reasons. Like, and I was sat there thinking, you know, for anyone who grew up doing sport and grew up... I did athletics, so I didn't really have people telling me I couldn't do it because we didn't have that in athletics but I played a lot of football at school and with boys who thought I shouldn't be playing and that moment at Wembley not even winning but just being there mm. and seeing how big that crowd was made me think back to being at school which wasn't that long ago and it made me think look how much something can change in such a short space of time and I got really emotional because I think it was such a good example of like the power of sport and the power that football can have for the, for good, um, and I just thought this is so much better than men's football. <laughs> like, it's so <laughs> it's such one. A, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're not used to winning, um, but th it's such a different game. And what I love about women's football is that it doesn't try and be like men's football. Like the fans, the media, the crowds when you're there, it is just its own little thing and even now as it gets bigger and bigger, I think some people may be worried it would kind of lose its authenticity and it doesn't feel like it has, it just feels like the new fans are getting on board with what the old fans are like, which is 
why I think it's so special. Absolutely. How did you feel, Carrie? I was also crying, obviously. <laughs> we were all crying. We were all crying. Because um, I watched it at home. I was, I was watching it on television. And I watched most of the tournament on television because COVID stuff and travel. But um, so I was watching it and... I just started sobbing at the final whistle and I cried for most of the rest of the evening. And my husband was like, are you all right? And I'm like, I'm just, I'm just so happy. <laughs> <laughs> and I texted Kerry and I texted Chris and I texted some of the other former lionesses that are here this evening and ones that I spoke to for my, for my most recent book. And I said, I hope you know that that win was your win as well. And that's why I was crying, because it wasn't just about this squad that won this summer. It was about all the women who played, who got them to this point, who pioneered that path. And this triumph is theirs as well. And I was just so moved to know that they were all watching too. And I wanted to make sure that they knew that that triumph was theirs as well. And I'm going to start crying again. <laughs> so, yeah, that's why I was crying. Did you feel that triumph, Kerry? So at the final listen, I, I was with my friend Jane. Um, we'd played football together from the age of 16 at, uh, at Crewe. And Jane was jumping up and down more than me. I'm quiet and laid back and <laughs> don't get really excited. But at the final whistle, I just thought to myself, this is what I dreamed of, where women's football should be. And it was just like amazing seeing all those fans and England winning, a, well, the female side winning a tournament. It was just like, yeah, this, this is what I wished and hoped for and dreamed about as a youngster. Is there one of the lionesses who you would like to play alongside today? If you had to pick one. Oh, can I pick three? Okay, <laughs> go for it. <laughs> four? It's your night. <laughs> you okay. go for it. Who would I pick to play alongside? Leah Williamson, Millie Bright. Lucy Bronze. Am I going to have another one now? You're making it you by the side one. team, aren't you? Jordan Nobbs. Um, yeah, I could, I, could, I could go a few more, but I'll, I'll stick with those, yeah. Can you give me yeah. the reasons why? Or? The reasons why? <laughs> yes. Uh, Leah Williamson, brilliant player, brilliant role model, very humble. I think she's probably the best footballing centre-back in the world. Um, Lucy Bronze, again, brilliant player, great attitude, humble, a winner, like the way she plays. Um, Millie Bright, as a centre off, I would not want to play against her. I think <laughs> very tough, very physical, very focused. And again, I like the humbleness about her. If you meet her, brilliant person. And I think Jordan Nobbs, I just wish her well that um, she stays fit because I think she would get in, she'd get in my team anyway. And I think she should be in the England team. Creative, determined, technically good, sees an opening and scores goals. Sounds like a good combination to me. What do you think this win means? for the future of women's football? Just a small question there, Miriam. <laughs> um, I think it just means we can enjoy football in the same way that men have been, for, like, as a fan for so long. And, I mean, as a, someone who reports on women's football, it means we can have conversations that we weren't having before. It means that we can cover things that we weren't, you know, our boss will send us out to do a story. Um, and now we can be like, what about this and this and this? It's not just like a tick, not that it was at the BBC, but it's, it's never now going to be like a tick box thing. It's people really care and the audiences are coming. Um, I think it's just changed the world a bit. Just seeing, I was, I was interviewing ridiculously um, Alexia Pateas a couple of weeks ago. Um, and we stopped the interview and it was like a Lego event and there was loads of kids there. And honestly, like 300 kids just swarmed on her. And it was like, she was like Madonna or something. <laughs> I was like, this is crazy. And I just stood there and just watched and was like, this is wild. Like we, even a year ago, you couldn't have imagined mm -hmm. something like that. And it made me really emotional. It, it all does. But like just 
seeing that happen and seeing all those little kids be her the superstar that she is, I just feel like that even, you know, a year, two years ago, that wouldn't have happened. So I think it has actually just changed the world. Like, even though it wasn't Spain that won, it's brought it, it's kind of elevated it for everyone, I think. What do you think, Kerry? You can have the big question now. Yeah, I think um, everything that Miriam said, but also, I guess, I wouldn't want anyone to think of the summer as the pinnacle of women's football. I feel like this should just be a starting point. Mm. There is so far to go. And I was very heartened by the fact that the Lionesses actually said, was it two or three days after the win? They're like, this isn't good enough, what you're doing in schools. It's not good enough in terms of what you're doing about encouraging female coaches. You need to sort this out. We're calling on the prime ministerial candidates. Sorry, I laughed at prime ministerial candidates um, to sort this out. <laughs> um, and yeah, so this is, a, this is a starting point. It's a great springboard, but now we need to use this to build to the next level. And I think Miriam's also right in kind of highlighting kind of the superstardom of female footballers now. And I think that's qu quite exciting. And I think we started to see that this summer with some of the transfers. We see some of these big names from Europe coming in for English players, not just because of their footballing ability, I would suggest, but also because they've got name value, they're brands, they're recognizable, they'll sell tickets, it's bums on seats. And I think that commercial value in the women's game hasn't necessarily been recognized in history, and I think it is now. And I think that's quite an exciting point to be at. Definitely. And what do you think, Kerry? What does this mean for the future? It's very positive, but I agree with what uh, Kerry was saying. It's the start of the journey, and it needs taking forward and keep going and keep going. Um, so the women, the, the sport, the quality of the football gets better and better. Um, and it's only what women athletes do actually deserve what's happening now. It's definitely well deserved. I think it's time for a break now. And then we will come back, speak a little bit more, and then you guys will be able to ask some questions. Thank you very much. <laughs> so I hope you've all had some nice refreshments and bought a copy of Carrie's book. <laughs> now we're going to start off with some quick fire questions to Kerry. So who is your favorite player you ever played against? Veronica Bailey, she's here somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a few, I've got a few. What? Who else? Carolina Maracci, an Italian centre forward. Um, Gillian Coulthard. Who I played against, did you say? Or well, you can say with as well. Um, I've mentioned Leah Williams, I'm I, Jordan Nobbs, Lucy Bronze, Millie Bright, um, Jane Burgess. Uh, I'd have to think about that. It's hard when you <laughs> like that. I'm old now. <laughs> no, you're not. Kerry, you mentioned Millie Bright in the first half. I imagine that would be the, 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 the tough sort of player you wouldn't want to come up against. Who was your toughest ever opponent that you hated playing against? Um, there was a, a player in Italy, um, I can't remember her name, um, played for, I think it was Monza, and the Italians then used to get away with everything, like the plumbing of shirts, <laughs> and just like sneaky, sneaky, like fouls that you found difficult to keep cool. Um, Mo Marley used to play for Everton, I think she's now the under-23 coach, she was like, very physical, so I had to be clever, so I just drop off them. And so, getting into a fight with that type of player, it wasn't my Couldn't cup of tea it. anyway. Um, so, yeah, those two were pretty tough. Uh, can I ask two questions? <laughs> Don't know if right. you get two answers. <laughs> <laughs> so, obviously, we just had the Ballon d'Or, a lot of people thought Kotea shouldn't have won, Who should or shouldn't. Well, a lot of people said she shouldn't have. Okay. Do you agree with that? So we were having a discussion. Um, we've got a little WhatsApp group of me, Chris, Leah, and Jill. We've got this little WhatsApp group, and we were discussing this. 
and I think Wait, the way the you, vote... you, Chris, Lee Williams and Joe No, Scott no, 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 it's um, <laughs> like Chris <laughs> as in, so you know the team that went to the unofficial the world, yeah, that's yeah, Chris, it, yeah, yeah, that's yeah. it. Um, we've got little WhatsApp group and we're having this discussion and uh, they all thought Beth Mead should have won. And yeah. I think yes, but the way they do the voting and how they do it, that's why the Spanish lady won, I think, and when the voting is casted. But um, yeah, I think Beth Mead should have won, but okay. it's just the way they do it that makes it that I can't pronounce her name. Pateas. <laughs> Pateas. That's why she won. Um, I think Sam Kerr should have won. Anyway. Okay. You're a Chelsea fan. <laughs> <laughs> um, who would have won the Ballon d'Or when you were at the, if it existed then, when you were at the peak of your career? <laughs> I should have won. <laughs> <laughs> at least one, anyway, somewhere along the line. Yeah, I think we'll all accept that. What was your favourite goal you ever scored for England? Um, that's an easy one, actually. Um, we played Denmark in the seven uh, semi-finals of the Euros, the 84. And um, it was Denmark at Gresty Road crew. And uh, the ball was played into me. I was, I don't know, about 25 yards out. And the goalkeeper was off a line, so I just clipped it over her, and I always remember, I think it was Sue Law, she was sitting on the bench, and Martin Regan was the manager, and he saw me going to shoot, and he was saying, no, no, Kerry, <laughs> not from there. Then she said, he got up and goes, go! <laughs> <laughs> what celebration did you do? Hmm. I think uh, one of my cool ones, probably not getting because Denmark were a top team. <laughs> even though it, I think it put us 2-1 ahead for the first leg, I just knew that if I went over TT, that probably get egg on my face within the second leg. So, <laughs> so no knee slide then in the mud? No, no, no I, nev I never did a slide, no. no. <laughs> Can you tell us a little bit about, this is not a quick fire question, but w what it was like being in an England squad at you know, at the start of your career. How, much, how did that change from the start of your international career towards the end of your international career? Because by the time you finished, the FA had officially taken over women's football, hadn't it? W was there a great change? Yeah, I, I, I felt the, ch the biggest change was um, when the FA took over, I think they thought we were fully, full, full-time professionals and we used to train twice a day. And it was something, when, when, when you look back at it now, like science has moved on, our bodies were not used to that. And I found that when the FA took over, when it came to game day, you were shattered. It was quite tough. And saying that you had to do a lot of your own training and go to work, it was really difficult. Where uh, when I first started to play for England, we didn't know. We didn't train as like intense, so you were still fresh for the games, or maybe I was younger then, <laughs> so <laughs> I don't know. Um, did you have to wash your own kit? At club level, yes. At England level, um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was probably one of the WFA, um, officers that took the kit home. Didn't have a kit person. We used to have to carry the bags ourselves. and We did everything ourselves, basically. <laughs> Pardon? No, no, no. Yeah, that was a good thing when the FA took over. Um, you had two shirts, a long sleeve and a short sleeve. And you got to keep those when the WFA were in charge. Um, you didn't get nothing, you didn't, you have to, even like the polo shirts that we wore, we had to pay for those, we had to pay for everything. So the FA taking over was a little godsend in terms of freeze. And you're probably thinking, I'm crazy here, but when you've had to pay to play and you just get a little freebie, it's very, very nice. Oh no, freebies are always good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> always. Um, when 
the WFA were in charge, how much did the kits change or did they at all? So uh, there's one up in the museum, isn't there? So it was like a nylon kit. Um, it's probably worth about two ninety nine. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that was the first kit I played in. Um, but it was an England shirt, so it didn't matter that it was not of high quality or snazzy and nice to look at. Then we got a um, sponsorship from Spore, who were a small company, not like Adidas, Nike, and all that. And the, the kit was actually really, really nice, really nice both to look at and to wear. Have you got a favourite? A favourite? It would be that spore kit, so it, it, it's got like blue and red going across the chest and it was a V-neck. I've got photographs of it, but the kit, probably when the FA took over, the WFA stuff, it all disappeared. And that made me quite sad, actually, because there's nothing to show for that, nothing in the museums or nothing. Um, yeah. But that would be my favourite kit, that one. I know you said you gave a lot of your shirts away to friends, family. Mm -hmm. Did you get any opposition shirts back? And which is your favourite one? Um, it would be my Italian shirt. So I've, I've, kept, I've kept most of those, actually. I had about four or five. And I, I still got three. And I'd say the Italian shirt, the Diodora. I love the Diodora. Those are my favourite shirts, yeah. So, uh, Harry asked you about your career highlights. I'm going to ask you a really horrible question. Mm. Do you have any regrets in your career? Um, I had a chance to join Arsenal, probably. When was that? Would have been... It's when I was at Croydon, so that would be... 90... Mm. <laughs> I'm on Wikipedia now. It'd be after the World <laughs> Cup. Would have been after the World Cup 95. 95, 96. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. we won the double then, didn't we? 95, 96, yeah. So that period when I was at Croydon, I had a chance to join Arsenal and I decided to stay loyal with Croydon. Was it just a loyalty thing? You thought? Yeah, it was. It was yeah. actually, yeah. Yeah. I'm a bit like that. <laughs> um, if you could. Who out of the current Lionesses squad do you think you play most like? Um, or play like her. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, someone else would have to answer that, I think. Um, Does anyone so in the audience have any ideas? Answering that one. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody's too young to remember me playing, except my friends. There's one or two <laughs> over there. <laughs> <laughs> they might know. So, um, I was a centre forward for England, so if I think Ellen White, no. Uh, Russo, no. Uh, Jodie Taylor, maybe, a bit like her. Just did your own thing. Yeah, that, my friend Tina, Tina Lindsay, who um, played for England a few times, and we've remained friends. She, that's what she says to me, yeah, you're unique, you just did your own thing. <laughs> So, yeah. <laughs> Which WSL team in the current day would you like to play for the most? Uh, the ones that pay the most money. <laughs> <laughs> Good answer. Uh, Arsenal, Man City or Chelsea? Why? Um, they've got the best managers, best facilities. It's more how they can develop you. They play on the best pitches, things like that that can make football enjoyable. So, you know, having nice training kit, things, yeah, things that make your life comfortable. So it'd probably be one of the top teams. And free stuff. <laughs> Pardon? Free stuff as well. <laughs> Whenever yeah. I ask former players this, they always kind of like split along two lines. Do you wish you were playing now with the chance of professionalisation or the money that goes with it? Or are you happy to have played when you did and all the benefits that went with that and the camaraderie that you had? Both. You can't say both. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> if you now. Have, yeah. Play now. now. Yeah. 
Why? <laughs> Why? Um. <laughs> it's that. Um. Playing in front of people. Because yeah. it brings them joy and it brings you joy. It makes a difference, doesn't it? Playing yeah, it in front does. of a crowd. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. So if my nephew, brother, mum, dad came to watch me, made me feel good about myself. Mm. Someone was there watching. It also makes a difference to the way you play, I think, as definitely, well. Definitely, yeah. definitely. Did you have any pre-match rituals or superstitions? Um, yeah. I had a T-shirt that somebody gave me, and it would got a, a picture of Pele on. And I had it for years and years, and under the arms, it had gone all, like, hard. And <laughs> I, still, <laughs> I still wore it under my kit, and people used to look at me. <laughs> yeah, that was my biggest superstition. Yeah, yeah. Rain, hail, snow, or blow. I wore this white T-shirt, and it got a picture of Pele on the front. Mm. <laughs> so the World Cup for the men's nearly here, but also the Women's World Cup is very, very soon. What do you think is in store for the Lionesses this time around? I think the same as for you. Is I believe they could win it. Um, if they didn't win it, it wouldn't surprise me. And I think the same again. Um, I think the World Cup, you've got the USA in the mix. I think Germany will come again. Um, I think they'll take the experience from the Euros into the World Cup and knowing what the Germans are like and played against them many, many times. Um, but yeah, I believe England could win. I think we've got a brilliant coach, brilliant setup. Everything is there in place for them to win it, the organisation. So yeah, they can win it. And I'm opening this up to Carrie and Miriam as well. Yeah, kind of much the same, I guess. One of the things that I found most incredible, I think, about watching England this summer was the way that they said afterwards, they never went into a match thinking they were ever going to lose. Mm. At no point during a match did they ever think they were going to lose a match. And I think that kind of belief, that kind of I don't know, unwavering self-confidence is very unusual. It's something you isn't it? don't come across very often. And having that mentality in a team is extremely valuable. So mm. I think that is going to be a big advantage. Absolutely. Um, I think... I'd love, obviously, England to win, but I think it's going to be tough for them to win. I think, they'll, I think Spain will do really well, and Germany, obviously. Um, I also think Australia will do really, mm. really well. I think they'll kind of be, not a dark horse, but I think just being at home will really help them. Um, and I'd love to see that. I'd love to see that. I told Caitlin Ford when I was drunk that <laughs> she's going to win the World Cup. <laughs> she was like, who are you? And I was like, <laughs> I was like I'm a Matilda fan. That's all you need to know. <laughs> <laughs> now, I just want to take it back to obviously one of the reasons why we're here. You're the first ever female black professional player for England and you're hugely successful and many look up to you. What does that mean to you? Um... My heritage is very important to me. Um, so when I played, and I, I, I realized I was the first player of dual heritage to play for England, but I was just playing football. It's only now that you think, you think about it and you think, yeah, that's, that's an achievement. And it is, it's important to me, very important. It's a massive achievement and you're a huge hero to so, so many people. And it's been a lot of talk it, this week, hasn't there, about the diversity in the squad at the moment? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's been an interesting week because of some comments that were made. I think I was trying to be... Uh, I'm trying to speak quickly because I could talk about this for hours, but I think... Um, it's been really nice to see more and more people talk about the lack of diversity in the women's game. And obviously it's a bit of a bizarre thing because 10 years ago this wasn't really an issue. We had any, we had Anita, Alex, obviously everyone grew up watching Rachel Yankee. And now it's, um, it kind of dawned on me, I was at Rotherham watching a France-Iceland game during the Euros and there was, more, there was a player of dual heritage playing 
and she probably played more minutes than any mixed race England player. And that's when it dawned on me that like, well, not then, but like so it, it doesn't look great. Um, and we know that it's nothing to do with the kind of the Lioness is set up or when people get there, it all starts much further down. Um, but I think the way that these players push for opportunities for young girls in schools, which is where it starts, um, is such a positive thing because it's, they're really using their platform and they're really speaking about it. And the white players like Leah, like Lotta, I interviewed them a couple of months ago and they said some incredible stuff about getting more girls of color into the game, which is what we need. Um, and when you look at the men's squad and you compare it to the women's squad, something isn't quite right there. So I think people know that it's an issue. The FA know they've got loads of stuff that they're doing, but the more we talk about it and the more it's not just people of color like us talking about it is really helpful because it can be draining, like even just reporting on it, it can be draining trying to get people to let you tell their stories. Um, so yeah, I think the more we celebrate the past as well really helps. So things like this are amazing to look back and think, right, if it was like that then, it shouldn't be like this now. I think there is a tacit acknowledgement in the FA. I think it's not, not even tacit. I think they are starting to acknowledge that it might have been an unattended knock-on effect of the way that they launched the WSL so quickly and revamped their structure and their talent pathway because they haven't been picking from the same diversity of talent that they, that they were before that. So basically, although we have had massive progress in some respects with this push towards professionalization, there's also been a massive de demographic that's been left behind that has been badly served by these changes and they're looking to rectify that now, it looks like, I hope. Yeah, it's all to do with the, the structure of the pathways and the mm -hmm. emerging talent centers and the regional talent centers and how a lot of girls of color in big cities can't get the training if it's an hour or two hours away. If a lot of people, if, you have a, if you're from a single parent family and you're reliant on someone to take you to training, that's just not an option. Um, and it's, it's a big thing that I think, yeah, it wasn't intended, it just happened. Um, but I think there are so many people doing good work and, and hopefully this is just like a temporary thing. And we see young players like Ebony Salmon coming through and we see, you know, the WSL is getting more diverse, hopefully. So hopefully this isn't a conversation that we will be having in two or three years time. Um, and also like it, I think, the PFA are doing amazing stuff with their AIMS program for getting more Asian people into the sport because obviously we know it's an issue in the men's game, but people don't even talk about it in the women's game. And now we're starting to see more, we've seen like Molly and Rosie Kamita coming through, but we're starting to see more and more people. It's not just those two, um, which is really good. Like this year, we celebrated 20 years since Bend It Like Beckham came out. Um, and that I was like, love Bend It Like yeah. Beckham. <laughs> I love it so much I made a documentary about it. <laughs> <laughs> um, and we got to film some of that here, which was amazing. But it was such a reminder that like, that was 20 years ago and things haven't changed. Like we've, we've not seen loads of Asian people in women's football since then. And it's kind of like a bit of a wake up call really. And I think the Euros was as well. So hopefully things change. Yeah, they definitely need to. Okay, I think it's time to hand it to the floor and ask if anybody's got any questions for Kerry or any of our panel. <coughs> Hi, thank you all very much. So I've got a raspy voice at the moment. Um, I'm just sat here delighted um, to know that Kerry's sat there and she's paved the way. Um, blah, blah. I'm a reporter from talking about my generation for people who were born in our year, Kerry. <laughs> I was born the same year. Um, I just want to say that women's football has opened the doors to make a difference to the sporting world. First of all, they dribbled the cobbles to scoring paths of goals. And I think it's wonderful to see that. Um, we talked about colour. Um, that happens in all sports, including athletics, where I coach as well. And the fact that we have lots of young girls of color who are playing football and training but can't get through that door they need to know more about yourself and now that you're in that hall of fame that needs to be more in the schools and in the sporting 
areas of the schools so that children can see that picture and recognize that they can get there. I have one of my athletes that is now playing for Everton girls, Gabriella George. Woo! I know. <laughs> Doretta used to coach me and Gabby George. Yes. And like, we knew Gabby was a superstar, but just like, to that's see the same her. thing, isn't it? You <laughs> and Gabby George. <laughs> Absolutely <laughs> superb. But one of the questions I wanted you to ask you, Kerry, was before you started football, were you always good at sports? And if you didn't do football, what was your alternative for you? What would you have done? Yeah, I've, I've played I've netball. Well, when I was at school, it was either netball or basketball for girls. But I actually played football in my lunchtime and break time. Uh, netball, it's too restrictive for me. Football ticks all the boxes. You're free to run with the ball. You can do all sorts of things, whereas netball, not so much. Um, Probably sprinting would be the sport that I would choose if it wasn't football, but football is a passion that nothing tops football, nothing. Okay, any more questions? Uh, this is a question for the full panel. Uh, you spoke about pathways for young girls, and um, you said that people from uh, dual heritage, black, uh, Asian, ethnic minorities find it hard to get to football. Uh, what I've seen is that a lot of young girls are now playing football at grassroots level. Uh, they pay to play football, which is normal for grassroots, but um, the uh, foundation has changed now across the FA. We have the ETCs. But what I've found there is that um, people have to pay to go to the ETC to get extra training that leads to the academy level football. Do you think if the FA made the ETCs free, more people from ethnic minorities might be able to get into that pathway and get to a high level of football? Because what I see at the moment is the cost of living crisis has mean that people have to consider they play for a grassroots team that does enjoy it, can they afford them to go to the ETC and do the extra training and get on that pathway to academy football? So my question is, do you think the FA should support women's football by making the ETCs free by funding it, by giving the football money to, the money to those football clubs? 100%. I think um, even just getting there physically, like putting men's in boys football, academy players will get picked up or get a coach to academies. Obviously, the FA would say, we don't have the money for that in women's football. Mm. Um, I don't know how it all works, but surely just take some of the money from men's football and put it into that because there's something wrong within those pathways. It's not working. Um, so 100% make it all free. And especially people who are from those inner cities who, who don't have the money or don't have the parents to ferry them around, like that's so necessary. And hopefully they're kind of learning from what's happening at the moment and the reflection and people talking about it a bit more. The men's game's got enough money to fund uh, the young players for the academy because they get the players who go through that pathway and make it professionals or they can buy them and sell them and make money. So surely that money should then be put into the girls' game and not to the boys' game? You should be in charge. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> can, I, can I just add something to that? I think, I think you're absolutely right, and I think you're absolutely right. And I think there's also kind of issues of like, socioeconomic background in there as well. And it's something that I've kind of started to notice probably over the last kind of 10 years. I kind of feel that the top of women's football is becoming more and more middle class. And I really noticed that and um, with, with Ellen White, actually, because I don't know if anyone knows her kind of origin story, but it's her dad set up the, um, the, ran the local club and he was running the girls' team because she had to move away from boys' football and he was running the club. And so if you've got a parent who has the time and resources and skills to do that, then fantastic, there's, there's your pathway. You've got a, a platform to get noticed. If you haven't got a parent who's got the skill and the time and the resources to be able to do that, 
what happens to the working class kid who is doesn't have that platform to be picked up. So I think there's kind of lots of overlaps there and real huge concerns. I think you're absolutely right, the cost of living crisis is going to bring this much more into focus. And I think it's something that probably needs to be addressed sooner rather than later because otherwise it's going to be too late, isn't it? It's another generation of talent you've overlooked. Absolutely, because some people might be facing the decision whether to turn the heating on or to send the child to football. And obviously they're going to heat the house and make mm. it safe for the family to eat, sleep and live in. So I think it definitely needs to be addressed, as Carrie said, sooner rather than later. <laughs> yeah, of course. Uh, because I'm involved in coaching at a professional level uh, with young boys, I run the Sheffield Wednesday Development Centre, so we get a lot of kids from ethnic minorities who uh, we've missed at a young age uh, because, like you say, it's very middle class. The young kids whose parents can afford to send them to little private academies, we get picked up at seven and eight and then come through, so my job is to get them through at a, a, a later age. But we use very good coaching methods and coaches have got experience. What I've seen when my daughter plays football is a lot of the dads are brilliant. They get involved at a young age at grassroots and try and coach these young girls, but they've got no experience or coaching experience when they're coaching these young girls, and so the methods are not what I would expect to see. Um, would you agree that it would be good if the FA could support girls' grassroots football by making it free for the men or women who want to coach these football teams to get them through a coaching pathway? Because surely if we've got better coaches at grassroots, it means we're going to get better players. Um, as an example, I've been watching my daughter play for the last three years. I've got that frustrated. I've just gone, regardless of the time it takes, I'm going to coach the football team to help her out and her friends because I want them to develop. So surely if I can do that, there should be other coaches out there who can help and the FA should be encouraging that. Don't you agree? So you want the FA to provide more coaches to young yeah, girls Yeah, because um, I know from my experience in Germany, for a coach to get his way for B badge level three, it's about £350 from level one, two, and three. In England, I was very lucky that the PFA paid for my level one, two, and three, and it cost me about £400 in total. If you're a grassroots dad, you've got to then spend about three to £4,000 doing that in England because the time wow. it takes and the money. Um, most people can't afford to do that, so the knowledge you get from getting level three and be able to coach players and um, get the best out of them, I think you need to get that level, and I think the level of coaching needs to improve for the girls to improve. And that's the okay. difference I see is other nations really invest in their grassroots by putting the money in there. But I'm not seeing that from the FA. It costs so much money now to get your coaching badges. And like we said, the, the cost of living crisis now is going to make it worse because people are going to decide, do I miss a shift to go to the FA centre to learn and pay that money? I'll just carry on coaching and do the best I can do. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. There needs to be some kind of, again, there needs to be some kind of plan to deal with it. The number of times I speak to chairman or directors of women's teams and they're like we appointed another man as head coach we wanted a female head coach but there weren't any suitably qualified applicants and I'm like okay but do you not think that there is then a problem with that talent pipeline because we know that there are great female players and we know that they are now retired and we know that they're going into coaching so why are they not progressing up that pathway why are we not seeing a grassroots mums take it up you know, I think there is an issue with the talent pipeline. I was actually on a call with the FA this week and they were talking about what they want to do to encourage more coaches through. So again, I think it's being addressed, but I'm not sure that they're talking about subsidising it. And I think you're right, they should be. Um, I live in Wales and I know that they've been doing a lot of work to encourage more female coaches through particularly. And they did this quite sweet little promotion at the start of the season. It was like two for the price of one. So if you go with your friend and you're both women, you sign up for your level one coaching badge. It was half price as well. So that was kind of nice. And I think that we also go some way to addressing what I think, and again, from what I've found from talking to people, I think women are quite often intimidated to go to a whole seminar room full of ex-professional male players or grassroots dads who have forgot years of experience in coaching. If they're going in at level one, they've not done it before, it can be intimidating. So I think that kind of, that solidarity of encouraging two women to go along together was quite nice. What about you, Kerry? Did you ever think about going into coaching full time and... I could see myself being a manager of a team, me picking the team, doing the tactics, but coaching is not for me, nothing like playing. Um, so I do that, but I actually think that um, 
the FA missed a trick when my generation yeah. were there because apart, it was Hope Powell, Marianne Stacey, and I'm struggling now, who went into Mo Marley. Then I'm struggling my generation who went into coaching or were given the opportunities. I don't think women are given the opportunities mm. and uh, what Ryan was saying there, probably lack of funds. Um, to me now, the FA, they've sorted out the elite, the first, the senior England team and underneath. Now they need to sort out grassroots and it probably comes down to finance. Have mm. they got the finance to do that? Then find a way with sponsorship, um, maybe at club level, you know, there's some rich clubs out there and maybe they need to direct the money into the women's game because they do with the boys' football and the men's. But we will see. We've probably got time for one long or two quick questions. Does anyone have a final question you want to? Yeah. Um, so I've got it written down here. Uh, women's football matches during the Euros drew almost no violence or disruption, but men's football always seems to draw headlines for these kinds of things, uh, especially at club level due to opposing fans, especially in England. So why do you think there's a difference in reaction between men's and women's football, and can the men's game learn from this? <laughs> Who wants to take that one? Uh, okay, do you want me to just repeat the whole thing? <laughs> uh, I just said that Women's football matches during the Euros, especially, drew almost no violence or disruption, but men's football always seems to draw the headlines for these kind of things. So it's a question to the whole panel. But like, why do you think there's a difference in reaction between men's and women's football, and can the men's game learn from this? I can tell you the academic answer. <laughs> We'd love to hear it. <laughs> so there is a lot of literature which I basically scorned in my PhD because it's ridiculous. And it's, there wasn't really very much research done on the reasons for crowd disorder until kind of the late 1970s, they started looking at it. And they talked about kind of you know, drunkenness and they talked about you know, too many men together and their solution to this, these very clever academics, encourage more women to go because they will civilize men. They will <laughs> behave better if there are women in the crowd. <laughs> now, I'm not convinced by that as an explanation, but... I think you can probably say that there is more women at women's football matches than there are at men's football matches. Um, I don't, I'm not saying that women behave better because women are better behaved. Um, what, I, what I would say is that women tend to be socially conditioned to behave better. Um, I'm not going to go into too much of the literature review, but I think that's probably part of it. I think the demographics of it is certainly different. And of course, there's more families being attracted to women's football. Um, so you're going to get a, it's going to skew younger in terms of um, children being attracted along. Um, I think also disorder at men's football matches tends to get reported in a particular way. And maybe it's um, ex not exaggerated, but maybe particular things are focused on because it makes a better story. I think there's a certain expectation if you set if you set like a powder keg up and, and then you act surprised because it catches fire, like they did at the Euro final last year, I think. Um, so yeah, I think there's a combination of factors. Um, that would be my reaction. Mary, you have any thoughts? I would just say like, I mean, I could, I could talk about men. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't do that, I did really well. I would just say for a lot of women, Maybe it's also just that we appreciate it more because we've not, men have always had football, they've always had football matches to go to, and women, it's still pretty new that we mm. even have crowds, and it's still like the WSL is so new, it's still a really exciting thing. And I think definitely me and my mates, we go to it and we're like, this is so cool. Even now, after going to games for years, we're like, this is really cool, like, we don't really want to ruin it. and hurl abuse at people and there's like obviously there's more kids as well but um not to say it doesn't happen but I think yeah like we just appreciate that it even now it can happen I think it's something we touched on a little bit earlier isn't it it's kind of less tribalism in mm. women's football you're not going there just to cheer on 
our team, we're there for the occasion to watch, to watch the match more, more broadly. I mean, I think, there, again, th there is some tribalism. I'm not saying there isn't, and I think it's becoming more and more so, but it's not, sort of, it's not the same kind of atmosphere or setup. I always feel like it's a similar atmosphere at a women's football game in the crowd because it's family orientated. It's very much like American football. If you've been to American football, like it's very family orientated. Everyone's in the crowd and the teams mixed together. And I always feel like it's more of that kind of vibe rather than the same, I don't know, tribalism as you get in the men's football. Yeah, I, I um, my dad was a semi-pro player and then he worked for Sheffield United so growing up when I was like four and five I went to Bramwell Lane like every week and it was there that I first heard the P word being shouted at him like all this stuff that I was just exposed to so when I stopped going there I just decided never to really go to men's football and like now working at the VC Sport people are like what's your name who do you support and when you don't support a men's team they're like oh, are you an alien like where did you come from so I think it's just being comfortable. Like you can, I can go to Kings Meadow and feel completely comfortable in a way that I never would in a men's stadium. So I think, I don't know, I hope it, women's football doesn't get ruined by men like that, but <laughs> fingers crossed it won't. <laughs> Is that all for questions? Has anyone got one last one or? Okay, well, thank you so much. I think we've had a fantastic night, and I want to thank my wonderful panel, Miriam Walker-Khan, Dr. Carrie Dunn, and, of course, our newest inductee to the English Football Hall of Fame, Kerry Davis. <laughs>